So my topic is uh, Caterpillar Pest, but first I'd like to uh, uh, say thanks for the opportunity to come down here. You know, last year I came down and gave a talk, and and I really enjoyed the meeting so much I wanted to come back this year. Uh, this is quite a quite a meeting y'all got. So let's talk a little bit. This is our number one pest by far. Uh, I call it number one and number two. I think bow worms are the most injurious insect pests that we have, particularly with red bands being out of the picture right now. But the bow worm for us long term has been the most important pest for us to deal with in Arkansas. And for, for a lot of reasons, I guess, you know, bow worms are a little bit worse for us in Arkansas because first of all, we grow so many acres of soybeans compared to the rest of the Mid-South. And as a result of that, we got a lot of beans that are planted in, in June, uh, even up in July. And as a result of that, those late season beans really catch a lot of pressure for us. And, and it's, it's become a, a, an issue for us to, to make sure that our consultants are scouting closely and treating as needed. And I think this is another reason why our, our bow worms are so bad, that southerly flow that we get out of, of Texas. Uh, we did a study back several years ago looking at the pollen grains on adults in Arkansas and found that a lot of those pollen grains were from plants from the Rio Grande Valley and that kind of Mexico. So a lot of our, our bow worm issues are are triggered from those populations that migrate in from the south, southwest particularly, and you can see how that flow works for us in Arkansas. And they come up through Arkansas and they hit Crowley's Ridge and they just slide right up the ridge and, uh, and stay in our beans and, and, and really cause us some, some big issues. And if you look at this past season, you know, we had about 27 days of southerly flow. And when we see that, uh, shaping up that kind of weather pattern for us that's a good indication that we're going to start seeing problems uh, in, in Arkansas and if you look at the this is the trap counts in Lone Oak County that's the central part of the state but if you look at those patterns in 2016 and 2000, 2017 what you see is distinct peaks you know where you get that that about 30 to 35 day uh, generation time between those those worms but when you get that southerly flow you get a pattern more like that one that you see for 2018 that gold line where we peaked about two weeks earlier than normal and then it just hung it just it just hung the population hung and when we get into that situation that means we're going to have what we call those rolling populations of bow worms and that's where we start getting into issues for our growers about getting and maintaining the control that we need to have. Uh, because the last thing you want to do in soybeans is make two applications of a diamite, like Prevathon or Besiege. There's just not a whole lot of money for our growers in that situation. When you have to make two applications in that situation, it's not cost effective for our producers in Arkansas. And this is what we saw, you know, and, and, and you know, what you're going to hear today uh, when, when Angus gets up and talks about bow worms in cotton, it's the same thing for us in soybeans. We get this big flight, it comes in, they lay their eggs in that corn, and you can see those eggs there. When they lay like that, there's going to be survival in that corn, and when they come out of that corn crop, they're coming right into our cotton crop and soybean crop and they're creating some problems. And because of this increased survival that you heard about just now from Donnie, this survival of worms coming through this corn is making our problem with bow worms a whole lot worse. So that's that's what's going on. And we know what the damage is, what they what what, what bow worms do. And one of the funniest things I get is you know, you see that, that second point there about most of the damage is done in the fifth and sixth end star. That's when they eat about 90 to 95% of what they consume in their larval lifetime is in those last two end stars. 
And I get this question all the time, hey Gus, I got a bunch of worms out here and they're at treatment level, but they're all big, so I think I'm gonna let them cycle out. What do you think about that? Not much. <laughs> I don't think too much of that idea. Uh, if you got big worms out there, you best treat them, right? Okay. All right, so as we got into this situation and it's begun to develop even more in the last couple of years, we're looking, we're looking at our insecticides a whole lot harder about what's going to give us the level of control that we need to achieve. Uh, I got a call just on the way down here, believe this or not. Got a call from a consultant. And he said, here's my deal. He said, I had about 2,000 acres of late planted beans last year on, on a couple of growers. He said, half of those fields hit treatment level. I treated them. He said, I let the other half go because they weren't at treatment level. He said, I, you know, I, I would find a hot spot out in the field, but the whole field wasn't treatment level. And so I made the decision not to spend the money on Prevathon or Besiege. And he said, now my growers are cutting those beans and they're coming back to me and they're saying, everywhere I sprayed, I got a five to eight bushel yield increase over where I didn't spray on those late beans. And so I, you know, I think that it may be some of scouting, it may be a lot of things, but in those situations, I think you know, where I got a field on one side of the turn row and it's treatment level and I got a field just planted the exact same day across the turn row and I can't quite get to treatment level, but I got worms out there for two or three weeks and I got spots out in that field where I'm hitting treatment level, but not all the field. You know what I do? Those are the hard decisions and that's why y'all get paid the big bucks to make better decisions, right? So, you know, just we know that there's some things that we can do to avoid bow worms. Uh, if we plant early, like a lot of y'all do here in Mississippi, uh, y'all don't have the rice crop that we got. You don't have to deal with that like we do, but rice is a big, big crop for us in Arkansas. And if we could, you know, we'd plant the whole state of Arkansas early and avoid a lot of these bow worm problems, but we don't have that opportunity. Narrowing that row width and achieving canopy closure prior to bloom is extremely critical for us. If we got beans that are starting to bloom and we have not lapped those middles, those are the first fields we go to looking for problems because that's where they're going to be. So the goal is to achieve canopy closure prior to bloom and that's a big thing for us. And then lastly there is, is avoiding unnecessary applications. Now, how many people in this room go across the field when they make their R3 fungicide application and throw in something like Karate or Mustang Max? Can I see a show of hands? I don't blame you. I wouldn't raise my hand. I'd be embarrassed too. <laughs> That's about the dumbest thing that we can do is put a pyrethroid application out there and destroy our beneficial complex and open the door for worse problems than we had. And we're still fighting that in the state of Arkansas and I'm sure y'all are still fighting it over here too. But just be advised, if you're gonna put something out there, if you feel obligated to make an R3 application with your fungicide, use something else that doesn't disrupt that beneficial complex, okay? No pyrethroids. Avoid pyrethroids at all costs unless you got a reason to spray it, okay? So we worked for several years, and Don and, and, and uh, Angus and Fred and everybody, we worked on this threshold for bowworms in soybeans. You know, the threshold for soybeans ought to be just more than the number of worms in the bottom of your sack. It ought to take into account the value of that commodity, the, how much you're getting per bushel, and what it takes to control that insect pest. So it's more than just a number of insects. That's what a real dynamic threshold is and it has a, it, you can see how it impacts the decision on whether or not to treat and we got we got a lot of people that are that are looking at this now in, in Arkansas and, and we feel pretty comfortable with our numbers there and you can see at a, at a, at a, at a value of nine dollars per bushel 
and a, and a control cost of about 16 or 18 dollars it's about nine bollworms and that's pretty close to what we had always recommended nine per 25 but it's good to have verification and it's good to take into account how much money you're getting for that crop and, and how much that control cost because as you well know the cost of control has been high on some of these products and it's going higher it's not coming down the price of control is not coming down these costs of, of insecticides if you hadn't kept up you know there's big issues on available uh, active ingredients right now and a lot of the products that you're accustomed to using in your in your production systems is going up this upcoming season so take that into account so we're looking at these studies and we're not just looking for efficacy I know I can knock bow worms down in a soybean field I know I can do that with just about anything but what I'm looking for is something that's going to give me that control that I need in case I get reinfested, which is fairly common for us in Arkansas. So I looked at a lot of products here, and you can see what they are. You heard Fred talking about diamond earlier. We got Intrepid Edge, Prevathon, and Besiege. Several products, and we got some combinations there with uh, Bifenthrin down at the bottom. And then this is an interesting little study. Uh, so we, as you look across there, the check is on the on the on your left, and and you'll see the the uh, number of worms at three, six, and sixteen. You go well, well that's a kind of funny days to to scout. That's the only days we could get in there between six and sixteen. It was a constant rain situation. Everybody knows what I'm talking about with the weather we had this year. But we had the opportunity to get back in that field at sixteen days. Now you look at three and six days. And everything looks pretty good. The diamond was a little slow there, the one right by the untreated check. It's an IGR like the guy mentioned earlier, like Fred was talking about, so it's a little slower acting. But by the time we got to six days, the orange bars, everything looks pretty good. Where it all fell apart was we got reinfested. We got more worms coming in that field and we're running about one per sweep there in the untreated check and you can see what your what some of your products have done actually acephate and and uh, even some of the the pyrethroids down there on the end had higher levels of worms than the untreated check the only products in that in that list there that are given any kind of level of control of that second infestation is the Prevathon and the Besiege. Those are the only two products that kept, kept them below that red line, which is our threshold. This is another test looking at a lot other products and stewards included here in denim. Those are two products that are trying to make a little comeback. And we get kind of the same situation here. Now look how many worms I'm dealing with at three days after application in my untreated check, I got just about 60 worms on 25 sweeps. Our threshold is nine to 10, and so we're about six times threshold in this trial. That's a lot of worms. A lot of y'all in this room probably had never seen that many worms in 25 sweeps, but it's fairly common for us. But as you look across there at that gray bar, at 16 days after application, what you're seeing is Intrepid Edge at three and a half and five ounces gave it up. It's not controlling worms. Stewart is not controlling denim. Both rates not working. Uh, Lambda not working. And Lambda plus acephate looks like the acephate kind of upsets them a little bit. And we use acephate a lot. It helps us with knockdown, initial knockdown. And we use it in cotton too. But it doesn't look like it's a recipe for extending residual control at all. So these are the products. That, again, I didn't see. We don't see any difference between Besiege and at seven or nine ounces, and fourteen and eighteen ounces of Prevathon are working extremely well out to sixteen days. So we know, and based on the work that we've done in the past, a lot of times we're going to get 21, 28 days out of those products. They're going to give us that length of residual. I hate depending on diamides. I hate it. 
it's not the direction that we want to go. We're going to start getting into issues with tolerance and resistance. I, I, I realize that. But as it stands right now, those are the only products right now that are giving us that extended level of control that we have to have to maintain our yield potential in soybeans when we get in that situation. The new thing that came out that we're really excited about is this NPV. Uh, it's a virus. Uh, it's the Heligen, it's called Heligen. That's the, that's the product that we all look. How many people in here put out a shot of Heligen this year to look at? Anybody? Yeah, I see a few hands around. So we got about uh, I, somewhere around, I think they told us, you know, it's around 200,000 acres of, of soybeans got treated with Heligen this year. Uh, we had extremely good success with it. I've had a, a student working on a project uh, looking at, at this at this virus and and we've kind of figured out how to use it, when to use it, and to make the most of it. And that's what I kind of want to concentrate on for, for just a few slides. But this this is a, a, a living organism. Uh, it's very specific. Uh, only for bollworms and budworms. Doesn't kill green clover worms, velvet bean cat, any of that stuff. It doesn't kill any other caterpillars, it just kills bollworms. You gotta understand that. That's all it does. So you be aware of that. The cost is the driving factor for our our producers in Arkansas. If I can get that cost down around four or five bucks an acre, that's a hell of a lot better than an eighteen to twenty two dollar shot of dynamite, isn't it? Yeah. But it's, it's knowing how to use it and when to use it. So our current threshold, like I mentioned, is about nine per 25. With this virus, we use a threshold of three to five small larvae per 25 sweeps, okay? And that's based on the research that we conducted in Arkansas. And uh, you gotta hit them a little early. That means you gotta catch them early and you gotta catch them small. If you go out there and sweep and you got a bag full of big old worms, you probably need to back away from, from the helogen at that point, okay? So then it, based on our work uh, and, and, and the studies that we've seen in the past, it's effective only on worms that are about a half inch or smaller. And it takes about four to six days, so you consultants out there that got no patience, <laughs> you can't go out there at three days and expect to see dead worms. It doesn't work that way. This is not an insecticide, it's a virus. It's a living organism and it takes time. It's just like you catching a cold. You get, you get incubated and it takes two or three days for that thing to start showing some symptomology and you to get a runny nose. You know, that's how it works. We looked at the time of death and what you see is the bigger the worm, the longer it takes for them to die. Uh, you see that fifth end star out there why it dropped off, that's because we only had about two or three worms at the fifth instar that died. I mean, it just does not kill big worms. And, and uh, so it kind of throws that, that pattern off. But take it from us, it, it's going to take you about at least five to six days for a fourth instar worm to die if you're spraying worms that big. You got to have confidence in your application, and if you do it right, if you make your applications, then you can see reduced damage in feeding. We've seen that, we've, we've monitored that. Uh, you look at those larvae, you look for them to move up in the top of the canopy. Uh, and then you start seeing some, some weird stuff going on out there about four to six days. Those larvae will start sweating. They look like they got big sweat drops on them. And then they start liquefying, as, as you see in this picture. And so what we got interested in was, was how these things, how this virus was moved. I put it on one side of a field a few years ago, and I put all my, my insecticide trials on the other side of the field. And where I put the, from where I put the virus out in about five days, it was all the way across the field messing up my, my insecticide trials. I started seeing virus dead larvae in my insecticide trials in about five to seven days. I said, how, how did that get, the, the wind's not blowing that way. How is it getting across that field as quickly as it's doing? So we started looking at, 
at some of the ways that this thing can can move throughout the field and some of the projects that we're looking at is, is making strips early you know instead of treating the whole field maybe we can treat strips in the field and let it spread on its own now when you go to talking about residual control with Prevathon or Besiege that's true residual control it's staying out there in the field what this virus does is when it kills worms when it kills a worm it makes a virus factory so it's pre it's it's actually creating more you can put virus out and if you put it on a population and you start killing worms you're actually increasing the virus titer out in that field it's not residual control it's making more virus and in a situation like you saw with our population where we get that lingering rolling population out then that's that horizontal transmission we got enough uh, insects out there to cause that virus to move around and, and move across the field and actually the virus content in the field will increase because of the virus factories out there that are that are uh, larvae dying just some pictures you see a fly you see it up close for some reason there's a lot of insects that like to feed on these virus dead caterpillars we found when we got studying there's a green stink bug feeding on a virus dead caterpillar there's a, a cannibalistic that's another bollworm feeding on a virus dead bollworm so you know he's going to die he's going to get a dose there's a tarnished plant bug in association with that virus dead worm lacewing larvae wasp lady beetles all these insects and we identified 14 new families of insects that spread that virus not just by taking pictures but by doing pcr analysis of these insects that we collected that had the virus on them so now we know how that virus moves across the field it's by these insects. Look at the ants feeding on that virus dead caterpillar. It's pretty awesome. So here's the keys that we've determined that can make you successful in the use of this virus and save some money for our producers. You got to keep this virus, it's a live organism. You got to treat it like it's alive. It's not a jug of insecticide. You don't buy a jug and throw it in the back of the truck and leave it for two weeks. That's not a good idea. Uh, re realize that it only kills bowworms and budworms right now. Uh, we got a threshold that's a little different than the one that we normally would use for insecticides. You got to spray small worms, not big worms. You got to catch them early. That means you got to scout and you got to catch them and make that application on time. You don't tell the grower to treat today and he waits till next week to treat. It doesn't work that way. You got to be a little more timely with your applications. Realize that it takes four to six days for you. So you people that are, are, are not tolerant and you're, you want to see dead worms at three days, you're not going to like this product. You're going to have to get used to it, okay? And realize that it can be spread and, and it, uh, you treat it like, what, like in this picture, you treat it like uh, don't put your dog in the back seat of the car and leave him in the car with the windows rolled up. Well, treat your virus the same way. All right, loopers, let's talk about them for just another minute because that's probably the second most important caterpillar pest. And as you can see here, Intrepid Edge is providing the best level. This is 2015, and look at the green bar. That's karate. So that's where I wipe out my beneficials, and I open the door, and I make loopers actually worse than, I, than if I didn't treat it all. So knowing what you got out there is extremely important. And you can see, you know, got a couple of rates of belt, some steward, uh, Prevathon. We knocked the population down. I mean, we're looking at 100 caterpillars on 25 sweeps. But that's not the level of control that I would aspire to, you know, on most of this stuff. The only things that are really working real well are the two rates of Intrepid down there at the bottom. This is 2017, and again, I got Warrior in there uh, just to show you why you don't make the wrong application. And then you can see Besiege at 9 and 7, Prevathon, Intrepid's in here, Intrepid Edge, and all those products. But what you see down there, you know, some of the better products are Intrepid Edge, 
and steward for looper control. Same thing in this study. Uh, again, I blew up the population with a shot of bifenthrin and imidacloprid. Take a little, take a little off the karate folks. They get tired of me putting karate in, in those trials and, and showing that data, so I put something else out there. But you can see my best products are the methoxyphenazide, the Troubadour. You know, that's a product that's that's the same as uh, Intrepid. It's gone off patent now, and there's about five or six companies out there making Intrepid right now, so that should help drive the cost of the Intrepid down a little bit. These are my 2018 looper plots. I had something else in there. I don't know what that is. Anybody recognize that? This is late season, too, y'all, so I don't know where that came from, but... That's not loopers. <laughs> so I was showing the defoliation to somebody. Somebody called me. I said, man, I'm looking at some bad loopers. They said, drop me a pen. I'll come over and look at them. I don't know what. I don't, that's how. <laughs> so I don't know what that's going to help you find this location, but I, I dropped him a pen. <laughs> <laughs> so you see across here some different products. Intrepid, Prevathon, Diamond, Besiege, Intrepid. And again... You know, the Intrepid Edge and the Intrepid, all those products for us are still working. Now, they tell me the Intrepid's not working so well down in Louisiana, but for us, it's still maintaining. We're still getting good control with it here. Uh, this is what I call my methoxyphenazide trial because I got about two or three different products there with methoxyphenazide. You know, I got, uh, and that's what they're, one company's going to call it is methoxy. And you can see the rates at two, four, and eight ounces. Obviously, I'm getting a rate response with the eight ounces, and it compares very, very favorably to the Intrepid. And then you get down to the Intrepid Edge and Prevathon in this situation, everything's given fairly decent control. Now, last thing I got. You know, we've been looking at the Helogen now for about three or four years, the virus that controls loopers. Now they're coming with a product called Chrysogen, and it's a looper virus. And our results with it, and I think the results here in Mississippi, have been very favorable for this product. Uh, we're hoping that they don't mix the, the two products together uh, because I think they don't match up. The Helogen and the Chrysogen don't match up very well. I think there's a window for, for Chrysogen for the soybean looper virus. It works exactly like the Helogen does for bollworms. Uh, it works actually maybe even a little better. The, it, uh, based on my work, it looks like the knockdown is a little quicker than it would be with Helogen. So it looks pretty good. Uh, the data looks really good, and I think you're going to see the opportunity. If we get loopers this year in the Mid-South, you'll have the opportunity to see it and try it for yourselves. But uh, initial, initial work, the last two or three years that we've had to look at it, it looks like it's going to have some good play for us. And again, it, hopefully it's going to be a, at a reduced price like Helogen is and a lot cheaper than using something like uh, Diamide or something like that. So I think, I think we're in good shape.